The story begins with a vivid scene in which the red moon shines brightly. An evil entity launches an attack on a lone soldier, the sole survivor among his fallen comrades. The malevolent villainous confronts the last remaining soldier, taunting him by questioning his worthiness to bear the title of emperor. With a malevolent grin, she conjures a sinister shadow ball in her hand and raises it skyward, declaring that his reputation will soon crumble. Despite the dire situation, the soldier maintains a defiant smile and reflects on the successful completion of his original mission. He challenges the villainous to try and end his life. The villainous doesn't hesitate and hurls her shadow ball at the defiant soldier. He braces himself for the impact, anticipating the worst. The shadow ball strikes its target directly, resulting in a massive explosion. The villainous wears a satisfied smile, convinced that her dominance is unchallenged. However, her triumph is short-lived as she suddenly notices something that sends shockwaves through her. A second soldier emerges, bathed in a radiant aura, and valiantly shields one of his comrades from harm. The first soldier, still unnamed, calls out to the second soldier, who is revealed to be Yon. Yon expresses his apologies for his late arrival and assures his comrade that he will take control of the situation. With determination in his eyes, Yon leaps into action, aiming to catch up with the villainous. The first soldier, looking up at Yon, places his trust in him and conveys that he'll be relying on Yon to handle the situation. As Yon takes to the air, attempting to confront and defeat the villainous, she is taken aback and demands to know who he is, her confidence momentarily shaken. Yon, his eyes filled with anger, responds to her question by declaring that he is the one destined to cut her down, addressing her as the Lunar Fairy. Before launching his attack on her, Yon takes a moment to introduce himself proclaiming, as the moon-splitting swordsman, the villainous, utterly taken aback by the power of Yon, watched in terror as he unleashed a furious barrage of attacks. They took the form of razor-sharp slices that resembled a mighty Chinese fire dragon, each strike closing in on her. Screams of agony pierced the night as the lunar fairy was engulfed in searing flames and sliced to her demise. The once powerful enemy was now reduced to ashes, a testament to Yon's unwavering determination. On that fateful day, the heavens themselves seemed to respond to Yon's victory. They rained down nine strands of sword energy, marking the beginning of a new chapter in this epic tale. Fast forward six years later, at Waryong Manor, a red-haired child found themselves pinned to the ground, subjected to a relentless beating by a stern woman. The woman's voice was filled with anger as she berated the child, urging them to stop being weak and demanding that they rise to their feet. With a scolding tone, the woman continued to lecture the child about the importance of thorough cleaning, especially when there was an important guest scheduled to visit their home. The stern woman, her patience wearing thin, inquired if the child had been reminded about the task. The young boy, his voice trembling, replied that he did remember, his eyes downcast. The woman then questioned whether the boy was deliberately ignoring her instructions to clean up the backyard and ensure there were no leaves left behind. She leaned in closer, studying the boy's face intently, and in a softer tone, asked if he was disregarding her because she wasn't his real mother. The little boy, nervously shifting, quickly responded that it wasn't like that at all. The woman, unmoved by his answer, retorted that if that were the case, then he wouldn't have ignored her instructions if they had come from the mother who had abandoned him at birth, would he? The little boy once again nervously replied with a no. The woman continued, her voice growing more impatient, stating that he wouldn't have ignored her if it had been his father, who had been confined to a room for six long years, giving the instructions. The little boy, still trembling, repeated his denial, causing the woman to become even more furious. She asked if that was all he could say and peered down at him, demanding to know if he was rebelling against her right now. With a sudden shout, she insisted that she would teach him a valuable lesson today, unleashing her anger on the defenseless child. In the background, three younger children observed the scene from a distance, all with red hair similar to the little boys. Two of the children chuckled and mocked the boy for being so scared that he couldn't even lift his head, comparing him to a turtle. The older brother remained silent, his gaze fixed on his beaten sibling, devoid of emotion. Meanwhile, a group of travelers was making their way towards the city, discussing how six years had passed and the place seemed to remain unchanged. One of the travelers expressed their surprise at finally being able to meet their father's only sworn brother, Uncle Yon, as they approached Waryong Manor. As they neared the manor, one of the ladies reminded her husband to ensure that their clothes were neat and proper for the occasion. Another lady in the group asked her husband why they hadn't seen Yon yet. Her husband explained that Yon had mentioned feeling stuffy, so he had climbed on top of the horse carriage. This revelation startled her wife, and she scolded her for not heeding her advice, expressing her concern that Yon might fall and get hurt. 
despite her persistent calls for Yon to come down from the carriage immediately. Her husband reassured her, telling her to let it be. He remarked that it wasn't anything new, and they should have grown accustomed to Yon's behavior by now. The beautiful wife, still feeling upset, told her husband that she shouldn't spoil her like that. However, her husband simply smiled and seemed unfazed by her sulking. One of their children chimed in, trying to ease their mother's worries. He assured her that Yon's martial arts skills were at a level where she need not be concerned about him getting hurt. He then added that there was something important they needed to share about Uncle Yon. The young boy, brimming with curiosity, turned to his father and asked if Uncle Yon was truly as strong as to be called the Sword Emperor, acknowledging his incredible power. His father, wearing a warm smile, reminisced about the past, affirming that Yon was indeed formidable. He recounted how, six years ago, Yon had displayed the most flawless sword arts under the heavens, and if it weren't for Yon's skills, he might not be alive today. He vividly recalled the moment when the villainous had fired a shadow ball at him, and Yon had deflected it with his mighty sword. He emphasized that Yon's heavenly sword technique was on par with their Nangong clan's advanced techniques. This revelation left their son in shock, unable to comprehend why such incredible martial arts weren't known to the world. His father explained that Yon had retired, and they hadn't passed down his techniques to anyone else. He urged his son to bear this knowledge in mind, cautioning him not to say anything that might offend his formidable uncle. He then shared a personal story about Yon, mentioning that Yon had two wives, with a particular fondness for his second wife. Unfortunately, the second wife had passed away after giving birth six years ago, leaving Yon with a profound sense of loss and a lack of purpose in the world. The father went on to explain that he had heard that Yon had secluded himself in the room where his second wife had passed away. This troubled him deeply, and he felt compelled to find a way to coax Yon out of that room. He emphasized that, while they were at Weryong Manor, it was crucial not to mention Yon's second wife at all. It would be best to act as if they knew nothing about her or his seclusion. He asked his son if he understood his words, and the young boy nodded solemnly, promising to keep this in mind. Meanwhile, at the manor, one of the servants urgently called out to the lady, and she inquired about the commotion. The servant informed her that her husband had stepped out of his room. This news came as a shock to the lady, and she questioned whether it was true, genuinely surprised at the prospect of him leaving his room. The servant assured the lady that he was telling the truth. Her husband had emerged from his seclusion as soon as he received a report that the Nangong clan's horse carriage had entered the village. He was currently on his way to welcome them. As they spoke, the lady's fists were still stained with the blood of the young boy she had beaten multiple times earlier. She called for a handkerchief to wipe the blood from her hands and couldn't help but ponder the situation. She was taken aback by the fact that her husband had come out of his room upon hearing about his sworn brother's arrival, even though he hadn't done so despite her pleading with him for six long years. Despite abandoning his own flesh and blood during that time, he was now making the effort to receive his sworn brother. This revelation only served to further irritate the lady as she dwelled on it. She then remembered her only son and informed the young boy that he would finally get to see what his father looked like for the first time. However, her gaze remained cruel as she looked down on the boy, warning him that he was forbidden to meet the family in his current filthy state. The little boy, trembling with fear, agreed to her wishes and promised to remain hidden from the family's view. With a stern tone, the lady told the boy that he needed to understand how things were supposed to work in their household. She emphasized that he should know his place and that he must never reveal his unkempt appearance to others, as it would bring shame to the family. She then issued a veiled threat, warning him that he would face consequences if he ever grew too comfortable just because she wasn't watching him. The little boy, scared and obedient, simply agreed to comply with her wishes, vowing to reflect on his actions. Turning her attention to her own son and daughter, she asked if they were ready to greet their uncle. Meanwhile, the little boy walked alone, heading to the place he was supposed to go. His half-elder brother cast a remorseful and pitying glance at him, showing that he cared about his half-brother. Mubik's mother then gently placed her hand on his shoulder and called out his name, addressing him as her treasure, Mubik. She told him that he had a very important task that day. He would be meeting his uncle's daughter, Nangong Yon. She emphasized the importance of being friendly and treating her kindly. With a serious look on her face, she asked if he understood, and Mubik solemnly agreed, assuring his mother that he would remember. Meanwhile, the Nangong clan was on its way to the manor, eager to reunite with Yon. Upon meeting Yon, they noticed his disheveled appearance and asked if he was all right, expressing their concern. Yon, overwhelmed with shame and regret, apologized for not having sought them out all this time. He admitted to feeling unworthy of their reunion. His brother was taken aback by Yon's words, unable to believe that he was saying something like that.
he reassured Yon that they had worried about him and were delighted to finally see him. Yon responded, attributing their concerns to his own incompetence. His brother comforted him, assuring him that it was all right now that they had finally reunited. He introduced his wife as Yong Ha Yoon, who expressed her excitement at meeting Yon, mentioning that she had heard a lot about him from her husband. Their son, Nangong Chun, bowed with utmost respect as he introduced himself. Chun couldn't help but be surprised to see his uncle Yon in such a state. Yon, with his long red beard and a weakened state, expressed that it was a pleasure to meet them. He couldn't help but notice how much his nephew had grown. Despite his own weariness, he managed to summon a warm smile. Chun couldn't help but reflect on what he had heard about his uncle's six years of seclusion. The man before him looked haggard and vastly different from what he had imagined him to be. The reality of the situation left a deep impression on Chun as he stood there, face to face with his uncle Yon. The wife continued to express her delight at finally meeting Yon in person, reiterating that she had heard a lot about him. She then introduced Yon to her second child, Nangong Yon. However, they were surprised to realize that Nangong Yon and the fourth child were nowhere to be found. All the guards were taken aback, shocked that their young lady had once again disappeared without a sound. The wife apologized for her daughter's tendency to vanish from time to time but assured Yon that it was normal for a child at her playful age. Suddenly, the first wife, or the lady, appeared before them and addressed her husband. She inquired if he intended to introduce them to his sworn brother. The lady then revealed her name, introducing herself as Beek Miju. She urged them to come inside quickly to rest after their long journey. The entire family followed her into the manor to relax and have something to eat. Lady Miju took her son, Miu Beek, aside and instructed him to search for Nangong Yeon. She emphasized that he must leave a deep impression on her with a determined smile on her face. She asked her son if he understood, and Miu Beek nodded in agreement. As the sun began to set, the little boy, who had been hiding from the family, knelt down on the sand with his hands raised, waiting for the family to depart. His arms ached, and he wondered when the guests would finally leave. His stomach rumbled loudly, a painful reminder that he hadn't eaten a meal yet. Exhausted and hungry, his eyes began to droop, and the pain in his arms intensified. As he teetered on the brink of unconsciousness, he fought to stay awake, knowing that he would face punishment from his first mother if she found out he had fallen asleep. However, despite his efforts, exhaustion overcame him, and the poor little boy lay down on the ground, succumbing to sleep. Minutes passed by, and a young girl from the family ran towards the little boy. She was startled to see a malnourished and beaten-up child lying on the ground. The little boy abruptly woke up and, in his drowsy state, saw an image that resembled his first stepmother. Panic surged through him, and he began to apologize profusely. He kept repeating how sorry he was, berating himself for having dozed off without realizing it. He called himself an idiot for his actions, knowing that if he had done something stupid and angered his first stepmother again, she wouldn't forgive him this time. To his astonishment, the figure before him wasn't his first stepmother. Instead, it was a beautiful young lady who was looking at him with a gentle expression. It was Nangong Yon who he saw before him. Inside the manor, Yon was taken aback by his brother's plan to arrange a marriage between their children and the Nangong clan. His brothers laughed heartily, stating that Weryong Manor was more than worthy of becoming their in-laws. Yon replied, acknowledging that it was indeed a joyous occasion and wonderful news for their children. His brother then asked what he thought about it, inquiring if he would like to become their in-law. Yon fell silent for a moment before expressing his gratitude for the offer. However, he believed it would be better if their children had a say in their own marriages. His brother nodded in agreement, acknowledging the sense in his words. Yon continued to emphasize that as parents, they shouldn't have the final say in their children's marriages, as their lives didn't solely belong to their parents. Lady Miju, feeling upset and annoyed, considered Yon's words as foolish nonsense. She couldn't believe he would say such things, especially when she felt that she had always worked hard for their family. Unable to contain herself, Lady Miju interjected in the conversation, addressing her husband's brother. She inquired whether they believed their children might genuinely like each other. The brother chuckled and replied that it was indeed possible. He suggested that they arrange for their children to meet each other more often, providing them with ample opportunities to get to know one another. Lady Miju smiled and acknowledged that she might be overstepping, but she had a favor to request. The brother smiled and encouraged Lady Miju to speak freely. With a determined and somewhat angry look in her eyes, she requested that the Nangong clan provide guidance to her son, Mubik. This request surprised the family, and they inquired about its meeting. 
the brother responded by explaining that the Yon clan also possessed its own advanced techniques, and it wasn't a decision he could make unilaterally. Yon then spoke up, expressing his desire for the same assistance. He turned to his brother and asked if it would be inconvenient for the Nangong clan to help him as well. The brother found this intriguing and listened carefully to Yon's request. However, he raised a question about whether it was truly okay for his eldest son not to inherit the Nine Heavens sword technique. Yon explained that while their martial arts weren't as difficult as the Nangong clans, he was confident that Mubi had already memorized the Nine Heavens sword technique. His brother felt suspicious, as he had seen Mubik using an advanced move from the Nine Heavens sword technique six years ago. Yon then revealed the truth, admitting that he couldn't pass down that martial art in his current state. He promised to share all the details with his brother later in private. Suddenly, Yon felt a wave of discomfort, and something felt terribly wrong. He coughed violently and collapsed, leaving his brother in shock and panic. His brother called out Yon's name desperately and urgently requested a physician's assistance as soon as possible. Meanwhile, in Weryong Manor's backyard, Mubi continued his search for Lady Yon, wondering where she might be. He heard voices coming from the side of the wall and discovered his little sister with Nangong Chun. The young girl asked Chun if he had really met his archenemy and defeated him. Chun chuckled, asking who had told her such a thing. She explained that she had read it all in a novel, where he was portrayed as the Azure Cloud Sword who defeated all his enemies. Chun explained to Mubik's little sister, Xiaoju, that while his nickname was indeed the Azure Cloud Sword, the part about him killing his enemies wasn't true. Mubik hurriedly approached to retrieve his little sister, Xiaoju. He bowed down politely and expressed his apologies for any trouble she may have caused Chun. Chun assured him that it was all right and asked for his name. Mubik introduced himself as Yon Mubik and Xiaoju chimed in to introduce herself as Yon Xiaoju, making sure Chun didn't forget her name. Mubi couldn't help but become irritated with his sister's behavior towards their guest. Xiaoju defended herself, claiming that she was merely being very polite, and that her brother was always picking on her. Mubi scolded his sister, reminding her that it was impolite to ask someone she had just met whether they had killed their enemies. Xiaoju countered by saying that it wasn't her first time meeting Chun, and she considered them to be friends already. The quarrel between the two siblings continued, with Mubik feeling embarrassed by his sister's behavior in front of their guest. He scolded her for trying to befriend someone she had just met and urged her to stop talking nonsense. Xiaoju responded by accusing her brother of being close-minded, pointing out that it was one of his flaws. Chun watched the playful banter between the two siblings with a smile, silently wishing that his own sister, Yon, could be as cheerful and outgoing as Xiaoju. Mubik suddenly realized he had forgotten about Chun and felt remorseful for the rudeness. However, Chun reassured him, saying it was okay and that he appreciated Xiaoju's cheerful and bright demeanor. Mubik then asked Chun if he happened to know where his sister, Yon, had gone, explaining that he was looking for her so they could all become friends. Chun was surprised and grateful that someone wanted to befriend his sister and informed Mubik that he was also looking for her. Chun asked Mubik if he could make the introductions, as the two of them weren't familiar yet. He suggested that they look for Yon together. Mubik agreed, appreciating the idea. Curious, Mubik asked Chun if it was true that Yon couldn't speak. Chun clarified that it wasn't that she couldn't speak but explained that she was going through a difficult time emotionally. He expressed his hope that she would get better after becoming friends with Mubik and Xiaoju. Xiaoju chimed in, reassuring Chun that she would help cure her. Meanwhile, Yon and the little boy faced each other. The boy was intrigued by her beauty and realized that his stepmother had mentioned an important guest would be visiting. Observing her elegant attire and accessories, he concluded that she must be someone of great importance. The little boy remembered his stepmother's warning to stay out of sight and panicked, unsure of what to do next. He knew that his stepmother would surely punish him if one of the guests found him. Desperate, he decided to make a run for it, hoping to avoid any trouble. However, to his surprise, Yon caught up to him and grabbed his shirt, preventing him from running further. Startled, the little boy looked up at Lady Yon and began apologizing repeatedly. Yon noticed the boy's malnourished appearance and the numerous scars on his body. As Lady Yon gazed sadly at the boy's condition, he continued to apologize. In her mind, she wondered why he was apologizing so profusely, especially since she had only restrained him slightly. She considered the possibility that he hadn't received any martial arts training and noticed that the bruises on his body didn't seem to be the result of martial arts training but rather indicated a lack of proper meals and care. As Yon observed the little boy's red hair, identical to that of the moon-splitting swordman, she began to suspect that he might be the child of that legendary figure. Something about the situation seemed strange to her, and she wondered why the boy appeared so fearful. 
Yon knelt down to her knees and looked at the little boy with deep pity and sorrow for his unfortunate circumstances. She reached out toward him, intending to offer comfort and kindness. However, as Yon extended her hand, the little boy's trauma resurfaced. He remembered the cruel treatment he had received from his stepmother and saw her hand as a painful reminder. He recoiled and became extremely nervous. Yon now realized that the boy had never once experienced proper care or affection in his life. The little boy, still trembling from the memories of abuse, hesitated as Yon reached out to him with care and compassion, gently patting his head. It was the first time he had ever received such treatment, and it left him feeling confused but intrigued by this new experience. Yon gently asked the little boy for his name, and finally, we learned his name, Yon Jiaka. Yon lovingly stroked Jiaka's hair and assured him that she would protect him from now on with sincerity and compassion. Overwhelmed by the kind words and genuine care, Jiaka burst into tears. It had been a long time since he had received such warmth and kindness. Yon held Jiaka tightly in her embrace, comforting him as he cried. She reassured him that everything would be fine, and he gradually calmed down in her comforting presence. Once Jiaka's weeping subsided, Yon got up and extended her hand to him. They locked eyes and started running away from their current location. Yon led Jiaka to a hidden hole in the wall, and they both crawled through it, successfully escaping the palace. As Yon and Jiaka escaped into the city, it was the first time Jiaka had ever seen such a bustling crowd. He couldn't help but notice the tantalizing food stalls selling barbecue, making his stomach growl with hunger. Observing Jiaka's reaction, Yon knew just what to do. She purchased three skewers of barbecue for Jiaka, who eagerly devoured the delicious food. Yon patted his head like an older sister, and they continued their leisurely stroll through the town, enjoying the sights and sounds until the sun began to set. While they walked, Yon and Jiaka spotted a group of menacing thugs on the streets. Jiaka became frightened, but Yon remained fearless. She held onto Jiaka's hand, comforting him and assuring him that he wouldn't be harmed. Back at the manor, night had fallen. Yon was bedridden, and his sworn brother remained by his side. He asked his brother if he was worried about him. He replied that he was, expressing his shock at seeing her collapse. He mentioned the moon-slashing swordman and his astonishment at seeing someone of his stature in such a state. Yon then told his brother that he had nothing to say for himself, given the fact that he was in such a weakened state, unable to even take care of his own body. His brother urged him to stop being so harsh on himself and focus on a speedy recovery, emphasizing that he needed to regain his strength for the sake of their clan and his children. Yon continued, mentioning that he had sent word about their clan's feast being conveyed through the Nine Heavens' wise woman mirror. However, now he couldn't even see anything through the mirror due to his disappointment in the eldest son's weakness. He went on to explain that on the day she left, Yon Muryong had also perished within him. She had left behind children who resembled him, but he lacked the courage to face the child he felt he would resent, despite knowing it wasn't the baby's fault she had left the world. He asked his brother how truly pathetic he was. The brother insisted that Yon should not strain himself and should remain in bed, as he was not accustomed to seeing him in such a weak state. Yon was determined to make a request as a brother, despite his condition. He confessed that he might not be worthy to make such a request, but he asked his brother to take care of his children. This revelation surprised his brother, who wondered if Yon was going to continue talking that way. Yon explained that his children were unfortunate and had never received a father's love. For the first and last time, he asked his brother to become their father. His brother accepted this request as Yon's final wish. Meanwhile, the two wives were anxiously waiting for Yon's return. Finally, two guards arrived, informing the ladies that they had found them. Yon's mother was relieved to see her daughter safe and inquired about her well-being. She also noticed Yaka but didn't recognize him. To cover this up, the stepmother stepped in, pretending to care for Yaka and imitating Yon's mother by acting kind and motherly toward him. Jiaka trembled with fear, fully aware of his stepmother's cruelty. The stepmother continued her act, expressing concern for Jiaka and suggesting that his mother would be upset if she saw him wandering around like that. She then turned to Yon, thanking her for finding him. Yon's reaction, however, was filled with intense anger. She remained silent but her eyes conveyed her disapproval of the stepmother's actions. This sent shivers down the stepmother's spine. Suddenly, Yon's brother and Jiaka's older siblings appeared. Chun, in particular, was worried sick and asked Yon where she had been, mentioning that he had been searching for her all day. He speculated that she might have climbed onto the roof again. Chun then noticed that his sister was holding hands with someone. Yon turned to face Mubik, and Mubik couldn't help but be struck by the beauty of the young lady standing before him, holding his little brother's hand. 
Chun suggested that the tired kids should be brought inside first. As a result, Yon and Jiaka were separated, and their hands were no longer intertwined. Yon's mother then instructed Yon to go inside and rest, while Jiaka and the stepmother were told to follow them inside. The stepmother gripped Jiaka's arms tightly and warned him not to make it obvious. She even suggested that they could start a rumor claiming that she was actually his mother and not his stepmother. Jiaka, feeling sorry and fearful, agreed to her demands. The stepmother seemed irritated by Yon's attitude towards her. In July of that year, the moon-slashing swordsman, Yon Mu Ryong, did not awaken from his sleep and took his last breath. To address the absence of the eldest son following Yon Mu Ryong's death, Beak Mai Ju called in twenty warriors from her own family, the Beak Clan, to the Crouching Dragon Estate. The warriors from the Beak family became the armed force of the Crouching Dragon Estate, known as the White Tiger Squad. To fill the void left by Yon Mu Beak, who had left to train in the Nangong Clan, Beak Mai Ju undisputedly became the owner of the Crouching Dragon Estate. Meanwhile, in one of the Crouching Dragon Estate's outbuildings, Mai Ju was shouting and frantically searching for something. She began rummaging through drawers while a servant tried to assist her. Mai Ju asked the servant if they had found it, but the servant reported that they had searched the entire Crouching Dragon Estate thoroughly and hadn't found any martial law left behind by the eldest son. This news enraged Mai Ju, and she couldn't believe that it was impossible. She was certain that the girl had informed him about a feast. She ordered everyone to put away everything related to Yon Mu Ryong in the storehouse immediately, and to ensure that she didn't see any traces of his presence. The servant assured the madam that they would dispose of everything right away. Mai Ju then ordered all the members of the White Tiger Squad, except for those on duty outside, to gather in front of the building immediately. Mai Ju, amidst the frantic search for any remnants of Yon Mu Ryong's existence within the Crouching Dragon Estate, halted the proceedings briefly, as her subordinates continued arranging the goods and securing anything that could be linked to the eldest son. She issued another command, one that sent shivers down the spines of those who heard it. She ordered them to locate the little boy, the same one who might have knowledge of what she had been so fervently seeking. Mai Ju's face bore an expression that hinted at her determination to leave no stone unturned, no matter who or what stood in her way. Jiaka, the poor boy who had unwittingly become entangled in the web of this unfolding drama, pleaded with the guards who were tasked with his fate. He begged for mercy, repeatedly uttering desperate pleas in hopes of evading the ominous command he had just overheard. One of the guards, the one selected to carry out the order, reluctantly approached Jiaka. He couldn't meet the boy's eyes, his own burdened by the weight of this morally compromising task. With a heavy sigh, he informed Jiaka that the storage room would now become his quarters. The guard, attempting to justify his actions, implored Jiaka not to harbor too much resentment toward him. He confessed that he had little choice in the matter, as he, too, had to make a living, and compliance with orders was not optional. As the door to the storage room closed, shutting Jiaka off from the world outside, the guard offered a small semblance of solace. He suggested that, at the very least, Jiaka could consider this as a way of honoring his father's memory. However, Jiaka felt utterly hopeless as the door sealed him in, and his anguished pleas for help echoed in the confined space, seemingly unanswered. In the dimly lit storage room, Jiaka found himself surrounded by his father's belongings, each item echoing with the memories of a man he hardly knew. The scattered sounds emanating from the depths of the storage room sent shivers down his spine, and he couldn't help but feel a creeping sense of unease. How long would he be confined within these walls? The uncertainty weighed heavily on his young shoulders. As day turned to night, Jiaka's slumber was fitful and filled with troubled dreams. But with the dawn's early light, he was roused from his restless sleep by the sound of approaching footsteps. The arrival of food was a meager comfort, a daily reminder of his isolation. Each morning, he would receive a loaf of bread and a jug of water. The bread was stone hard and tasted stale, but it was all he had to sustain himself. On this particular day, as he sat on the cold, dusty floor, Jiaka's attention was drawn to something unusual behind a piece of old furniture. He cautiously set down his meager meal, his curiosity overcoming his fear. It was still broad daylight, and he felt emboldened by the reassuring rays of the sun that penetrated the cracks in the storage room's walls. With cautious fingers, he moved aside the dusty covers and unveiled a beautifully designed mirror adorned with jade. The mirror's surface, once gleaming, had dulled over time due to neglect. Despite its dusty and tarnished appearance, Jiaka could sense that this mirror held some significance. It was an unexpected discovery within the confines of his bleak surroundings, and it left him wondering about its story and its connection to his father. As Jiaka gingerly wiped away the layers of dust from the mirror's surface, he caught a glimpse of his own reflection. 
it was a fleeting moment of connection with his own image, a rare occurrence in his isolated existence. He muttered softly to the mirror, almost as if sharing his feelings of abandonment with this inanimate object. But what happened next sent a chill down his spine. His reflection, as though imbued with a life of its own, remained unmoving. In that dusty, tarnished mirror, Giaka's own likeness stared back at him with a haunting smile. The reflection's expression was eerie and unnatural and it seemed to possess a sinister quality that filled him with dread. Fear welled up inside him, and his voice trembled as he cried out for help, hoping that someone, anyone, would hear his distress and come to his aid. The once quiet storage room was now filled with his desperate cries, echoing through the dimly lit space. This concludes the first part of this series. Now, what will happen next? Will our little boy, Giaka, escape the storeroom? Will Yon or Yon's father come to his aid? Lastly, what will the creepy mirror do to our little boy? Stay tuned for the next part of this series to find out. That is all. Thank you for joining me on this saucy manwa journey. If you enjoyed the recap don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Until next time, stay saucy.